event sponsored by the Institute for, Cath for Catholicism and Citizenship and by the Aquinas Chair in uh, Theology and Philosophy at the University of St. Thomas. We're very happy to have you here and we're very honored by the two speakers that will uh, honor this event uh, tonight. My name is Massimo Fagioli. I am the director of the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship. And it is my duty to uh, say a, a few words on why an institute on Catholicism and citizenship decided to sponsor this uh, event. Uh, the motivation came for, for this ecumenical event from the acknowledgement that there is a connection between the idea, the modern idea of citizenship and uh, in history and the end of the wars of religion. Uh, and a very interesting Italian Dominican theologian of the 14th century, Remigius of Florence, one of the early pupils of Thomas Aquinas and probably one of the teachers of Dante Alighieri in his treatise on the common good of 1301 wrote, quote, where there is no citizen, there is no human. And so Remigius advocated a strict uh, theocracy as a political system. So we are not, are not going to follow Remigius uh, very far here. But in history, there is a connection between the development of theological ideas um, and of the relations between churches um, and citizenship uh, in the late 16th century in France uh, Le Politique, they tried to imagine a way out of the wars of religion. Uh, they believed in the necessity of, of a strong state and of a strong sense of citizenship that was above the cultural wars. Uh, that was a first step, but the, the step that we celebrate tonight is the step that we made a few centuries after the 16th century uh, in dealing with religious diversity and with uh, different uh, theological traditions, uh, ecumenism today is part of, of the modern understanding of citizenship. And that is largely thanks to the Second Vatican Council 50 years ago. In this sense, the history of ecumenism is part of the modern idea of a citizenship, of, of a citizenship rooted in the idea of religious uh, liberty. Not long ago in the history of Christianity, e excommunication meant also exclusion from social and political life. And so the event of, of tonight celebrates uh, the end of a long period in the history of Christianity between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church and the beginning of a new period, this event of tonight in particular focuses on one of the great moments in the history of ecumenism, the lifting of the, of the excommunications between, between Rome and Constantinople uh, in 1965. That great moment embedded in the most important event of, of Catholicism in the 20th century, the Second Vatican Council continues to bring fruits and we're very happy to host our prominent guests for this dialogue tonight. Uh, without further ado, I invite my colleague, Paul Gavriluk, to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We are delighted uh, to have amongst us today two perhaps most prominent uh, uh, theologians uh, and ecclesial minds who have shed so much light uh, on the matter of the ecumenical dialogue. I will introduce them in the order in which uh, you will see them speak. Uh, uh, Reverend Dr. John uh, Krisavgis uh, is uh, uh, the author and theologian who presently serves as an advisor to the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew on uh, items of ecological, uh, on environmental issues. Uh, he's also the clergyman of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Uh, he was born uh, in and uh, received his uh, college education in Australia, uh, uh, went to Scots College in Sydney, uh, which he completed in 1975. He subsequently pursued his graduate studies in theology and simultaneously also 
uh, uh, read a degree in Byzantine music in the Greek Conservatory of Music at the University of Athens. Um, uh, he also pursued um, a, a degree at St. Vladimir's Theological Seminary, and then subsequently his doctoral studies brought him to Oxford University, where he studied under Callistos Ware, uh, a prominent uh, Orthodox theologian. Uh, um, uh, Father uh, John's uh, uh, vast uh, uh, teaching interests cover uh, such topics as uh, 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 systematic theology, political theology, and also uh, a variety of social developments uh, in the Orthodox Church, as well as um, uh, ascetic theology. Uh, and many of his earlier publications precisely cover uh, this field. Uh, he, in 1995, he moved to Boston, uh, where he was... Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, should have mentioned, I should have mentioned the fact that uh, he was a lecturer at the Divinity uh, school um, uh, and the School of Studies in Religion, uh, the Divinity School in, from 1986 to 1990, and then subsequently uh, School of Studies in Religion from 1990 to 1995 at the University of Sydney. In 1995, he moved to Boston, uh, where he was appointed Professor of Theology at the Holy Cross School of Theology and directed the Religious Studies Program at uh, the Hellenic College until 2002. Uh, Father John's numerous uh, publications include uh, more than 30 books, and I will mention only a few of them that pertain uh, to matters of ecumenical dialogue and also particularly to the thought of Patriarch Bartholomew. Uh, amongst them, uh, in the world yet not of the world, uh, Social and Global Initiatives of Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. That uh, was Fordham University Press 2009. Uh, and then uh, uh, today's uh, talk will be partially also based on the book Speaking the Truth in Love, Theological and Spiritual Exhortations of Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. And that's again Fordham University Press 2010. Uh, and then most lately, uh, The Patriarch of Solidarity, uh, Ecological and Global Concerns of Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. And that book uh, now uh, presently is available both in Greek and in English. Uh, and that's 2013. And then finally, Dialogue of Love, Breaking the Silence of Centuries, Fordham University Press, 2013. Again, the subject uh, of today's talk. Uh, Monsignor uh, Paul McPartland uh, is our second distinguished speaker today. Uh, and he is a priest of the Diocese of Westminster, in the United Kingdom, and uh, presently uh, holds Carl J. Peter Professorship uh, in Systematic Theology and Ecumenism at the Catholic University of America. Uh, he uh, is also Oxford educated. He received his doctorate from uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, he was a member of the Catholic Church's International Theological Commission for 10 years, from 2004 to 2014. Uh, he has served on the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic and Orthodox Churches since 2005, probably the most important uh, commission uh, dealing with the question of church unity between Orthodox and Catholics. He has authored uh, numerous books, including the following, uh, The Eucharist Makes the Church, Henri de Lubac and John Zizioulas in Dialogue, 1995, reissued in 2006, uh, the Sacrament of Salvation, an Introduction to Eucharistic Ecclesiology, that is 1995. Uh, another book is A Service of Love, Papal Primacy, the Eucharist, and Church Unity, 2013. He has also edited uh, a volume of the works of John Zizioulas, Communion and Otherness, uh, Further Studies in Personhood and the Church, and that's with 2006. I mean, I personally, I should say that I'm yet to encounter a Catholic theologian whose, the titles of whose works would be so orthodox sounding. Uh, there, are four, there are four things that unite uh, the two thinkers that we'd be speaking today, one of uh, which I have already had the privilege of mentioning, and that is that the fact that they got their doctorates from Oxford. Uh, the second uh, if, uh, memorable trait is that both of them owe allegiance uh, to the Queen of England. Uh, and then, uh, 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 a point that I politely skipped was also the fact that they, at some point in their lives, have been deans of important theological institutions, which position they're very grateful to God they have subsequently left. And then finally, 
Finally, I think they also share a common respect and affection for the work of John Zizoulis. Well, without further ado, please welcome both speakers and the first speaker that will be speaking right now, uh, Father John Krasovkis. I'm never sure what to do when people sort of over-exaggerate um, uh, biographical note or uh, titles and so forth. But I did this evening think of, as I was sitting uh, next to my former student and beloved uh, colleague, Father George, um, a man that I'll be talking about uh, a fair bit this evening, uh, ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras, a great visionary uh, of church unity. And I remember a story um, from Athenagoras' life where he was dictating at his office to the chief secretary and writing a letter to someone, and he was just caking on all these epithets and uh, rhetorical you know, superlatives and until the deacon at one point said, but your all holiness, you give these titles out so easily. You're throwing this out, they're throwing that out. You know, we hardly know this guy. And uh, Patriarch Athenagora said, look, Father, I've been doing this for decades. And as far as I remember, not one of these epithets has been returned to me. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here this evening, and I'm very grateful to... Uh, my friend uh, Paul Gavriluk for the invitation, and to Massimo for um, hosting this event. I'm also delighted to be sharing the podium with uh, Father Paul at Heartland, uh, whom I've never met, uh, but whose work I've long admired. It's a real honor to be speaking about something that is very close to my heart, and that I think is at the forefront of um, the concern of our two churches, perhaps especially today uh, with, providentially I would say, not coincidentally, with uh, people such as uh, Pope Francis and the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew at the helm of their respective churches. In January 1964, and there's Athenagoras, giant of a man with long prophetic kind of a beard and piercing eyes. In January of 1964, two Christian bishops broke a silence of centuries with a simple embrace and a few gentle words. This, at the time, little noticed historic meeting in Jerusalem between ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI, reflected Christ's prayer that his disciples may be one. But the event literally transformed relations between the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches, which shared an entire millennium of common doctrine and spiritual tradition, followed by an entire millennium branded by mutual mistrust and gradual estrangement. Immediately prior to his encounter with the Pope in the Holy Land, the ecumenical patriarch responded to reporters asking about the purpose of their meeting. He said, I came here to say good morning to my brother. It has been over 500 years since we've spoken. <laughs> so when on January 5th, 1964, Pope Paul met with the ecumenical patriarch on the Mount of Olives. It was the first time that Pope and patriarch were meeting face to face since the Council of Florence in 1438. The venue in 1964 was symbolical. It was the site where Christ, on the night of his betrayal, pleaded for the unity of his followers. Of course, both leaders knew very well that any comprehensive rapprochement would take years, even decades. But when that 
demon of modern technology raised his head, their commitment to unity became very apparent. After the public dialogue was broadcast throughout the world, few people realized that the microphones were not switched off. The Pope remarked, it will take a long time to digest what my soul has received. I want to assure you at this moment of the absolute loyalty with which I will henceforth relate to you. The patriarch replied, I will do exactly the same. Prior to this meeting in 1964, for many centuries, the Eastern and Western churches had no formal contact and little informal communication. Indeed, historians sift through the dense history of centuries searching for causes of the deteriorating relations between East and West, geographical remoteness, cultural alienation, human rivalry, shifts in financial or imperial power, political developments, theological differences. And after what is today known as the Great Schism of 1054, we'll talk about that in a moment, there were only two brief encounters of reunification at the Council of Lyon in 1274 and at the Council of Ferrara, Florence in 1438-39. But both occasions actually left feelings of bitterness rather than hopefulness. The estrangement was, of course, sealed by the Crusades and the sack of Constantinople in 1204 when Christians slaughtered Christians. So mindful of this bitter history, in 1959, Patriarch Athenagoras commissioned the newly elected Archbishop Iarkovos of North and South America to visit the charismatic and angelic, now canonized, Pope John XXIII, who had just announced the Second Vatican Council to convene in 1962. When Iarkovos met the Pope on March 17, 1959, it was the first encounter between a patriarchal representative and the Pope of Rome since 1547. We're talking some big dates here. Patriarch Athenagoras himself, formerly Archbishop here in America, undertook the inspiring yet daring initiative of addressing a personal letter to Pope John XXIII on May 30th, 1963, wishing him speedy recovery from his illness at the time. That was the first time in some 400 years that either a pope or patriarch communicated directly with his counterpart. And in that letter, Athenagoras described the pope with words from John's gospel. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Paul VI later referred to these words as a flash of intuition. Unfortunately, Pope John died in 1963, unable to see his vision materialized. Some years later, responding to a letter signed by Metropolitan Maximus of Sardis in the name of Patriarch Athenagoras again, who congratulated Pope Paul VI on his election, the Pope sent what was the first handwritten letter from a pope to a patriarch since 1584, acknowledging his commitment, I quote, to contribute toward the restoration of complete unity among Christians. The Ecumenical Patriarchate, for its part, published the papal letter in its official bulletin under the title, The Two Sister Churches the first modern use of this ancient expression by St. Ignatius of Antioch. The same terminology would later be incorporated into documents of Vatican II. So when Paul and Athenagoras met in Jerusalem in 1964, it was only the second time in over 1,000 years, possibly ever, that an ecumenical patriarch was meeting face to face with a Roman pontiff. At the Council of Lyon in 1274, Patriarch Joseph was not in attendance. In any case, that gathering was more political in nature than ecclesiastical, orchestrated by the Roman Pope and the Byzantine Emperor. 
and at the Council of Florence, Patriarch Joseph of Constantinople did meet briefly with Pope Eugene IV on March 8, 1438. But apart from that, prior to the 20th century, diplomatic relations between the two seas were enacted only through representatives. Only once did a pope attend an ecumenical council, Pope Vigilius, only because he happened to be in Constantinople. So the historical dialogue of love, a term coined by Metropolitan Meliton of Chalcedon between Athenagoras and Paul VI, initiated a gradual process of breaking down barriers created over centuries. That was followed in 1965 with what Massimo mentioned earlier with another joint declaration read simultaneously at St. Peter's in Rome and St. George's in Istanbul announcing the unprecedented mutual lifting of the anathemas on December 7, 1965 when the same two prelates, quote, removed from both the memory and the midst of the church the sentences of excommunication dating to 1054. At the time, cynical observers described the event as purely protocol gestures, while conservative circles feared that sentimentalism might somehow trump doctrine. At a conference held in Vienna in 1974, then Professor Joseph Ratzinger emphasized the canonical validity and theological gravity of the 11th century excommunications, which inevitably resulted in tragic ramifications for the whole church. Next month, then, we celebrate the 50th anniversary since this lifting of the anathemas. So what actually occurred in 1965? And perhaps more importantly, what occurred in 1054? In the 1050s, Michael, Michael Cyrillarius, a very prickly and unaccommodating man, was patriarch of Constantinople. In the West, the monks of Cluny Abbey in France, with little if any knowledge of the East, sought to reform and reinforce the papacy. Now, there was no official communion between the two churches, but there was also no formal schism. Relations were strained, though they had been deteriorating since what is known as the schism of the two Sergiuses in 1014, after Pope Sergius IV sent a letter to Patriarch Sergius II with the Filioque inserted into the Nicene Creed. As a result, both leaders removed the names of their counterpart from the diptychs, as they're known, the list of canonical orthodox bishops, and there was no communion, what's called akinonisia, no communion between the two churches from that time, 1014. Patriarch Sergius announced the schism with an encyclical letter to the other Eastern patriarchs, who also broke off communion with Rome. For me, this rupture in communion of 1014 was, in a sense, far more momentous, far more serious than any excommunication that took place 40 years later in 1054, which in any case did not affect the rest of the hierarchy, clergy, or faithful of either church, and I'll explain why. So in 1054, Pope Leo, Leo IX, commissioned his delegates, his representatives, to visit Constantinople, to visit Constantinople for dialogue, mind you, to restore communion, to talk about the division between the, church, the churches. The head of this delegation was the French Cardinal, Humbert of Silva, a very arrogant Cluny monk that accused the patriarch from the very get-go of intransigence. Not surprisingly, the patriarch refused him an audience. Meanwhile, and this is a crucial detail that I'll come back to, crucial from a canonical and crucial from an ecclesiastical perspective, Pope Leo 
meanwhile had died in the hands of the Normans. And yet on July 16th, 1054, Humbert marches into Hagia Sophia and deposited the bill, the bulla, of excommunication on the altar. The contents of this bulla, appropriate Latin name, were as follows. One, and just note the level of the dialogue, the level of the accusations. One, Patriarch Michael is a simoniac. That's someone who purchases church office. Anyone hated by the Cluny monks was a simoniac. Two, Byzantines are blamed for ordaining castrated slaves. And were these issues last discussed at St. Thomas University? <laughs> Three, Eastern theologians were accused of removing the filioque from the creed. Four, Greeks were condemned of Manichaeism. Really, why? For using ordinary bread in the Eucharist. Five, the Greeks were charged with refusing communion to those who had... Uh, Father Paul? Short hair and trimmed beards. A sign of effeminacy in Byzantium. That's, that's the level we're talking here, right? And then the cardinal hurled his excommunications on Patriarch Michael and his followers. The contents of these excommunications are tragic. The consequences were lasting. But they do provide insight into the level of dialogue. Although the emperor, Constantine IX, was anxious quickly to sort of patch up differences, the patriarch was uncompromising. He summoned his bishops, he held a council, and he excommunicated the legates, accusing them of using unleavened bread in the Eucharist, shaving their beards and hair, and being what I would call wussy in their fasting rules compared to our fasting rules. And introducing the filioque into the creed. And he reciprocated the anathemas, directing them at Humbert and his followers. Now, again, what theologians sometimes tend to overlook is that the excommunications were only directed to the pope and his legates as to the patriarch and his cohorts. Despite their ferocity, despite their extremity, not even Humbert and Michael would dare excommunicate, excommunicate one another's entire church, at least not without a council. Neither church was sweepingly excommunicated, and the excommunications were not even technically valid, as I said earlier, at least on the Roman side, since the commissioning pope had already died. And still, 1054 remains in the books as the date attributed in popular conscience and historic memory to the schism between the two churches. It doesn't seem possible to me that bishops can send people to hell. And it certainly doesn't seem plausible to me that they can remove them from hell a thousand years later. But what happened then in 1965? What happened was an immense symbolical gesture of remorse and goodwill for past wrongdoing. Despite the personal character of 1054's anathemas, their toxicity had penetrated the heart and conscience of both East and West. So the lifting of the anathemas in 1965 could not magically or mechanically or otherwise lay aside the differences between the two churches, nor could they reestablish sacramental union between them. But they could remove from the history of the church a memory that remained an obstacle for any dialogue or reconciliation. Because the tentative rupture in communion from 1014 and the traumatic events of 1054 
had somehow been conflated in people's minds, creating the impression of a canonical and theological division that somehow occurred spontaneously in 1054. You know, at the end of the 11th century, Emperor Alexis I, Komnenos, asked Patriarch Nicholas of Constantinople, why was it that he was not in communion with Rome? After all, he says, there is no formal synodal documentation to this effect. That's true. In fact, when in the 16th and the 18th centuries people were searching for a date of the schism, they really could only discover the schism of the two Sergiuses. There was no discussion at the Union Councils of Lyon in 1274 or Ferrara, Florence of 1438-39 about what happened in 1054. No mention of that. Now, of course, what followed, the Crusades and the election of a Latin patriarch in the East, none of that helped. But through the centuries, we somehow lost our bearings in regard to relations between our two churches. I would propose to you that it is in that confusion between the lack of communion since 1014 and excommunications of 1054 that were dispelled in 1965, that's what paves the way for closer relations and prepares the ground for a theological discussion on such topics as the filioque or the infallibility or the primacy of the Pope. What then was the reason for the Great Schism? And what are the prospects for full union? In my humble opinion, the answer lies in the words of a visionary French Dominican, Father Yves Congar, who published an essay in 1954 on the history of the schism, observing that the mutual estrangement, that's the word he uses, between Eastern and Western Christianity has deep roots in the religious culture of both worlds that developed over the centuries, beginning long before 1054, while leading to growing prejudice and misunderstanding on both sides. And it's this estrangement, he argues, that caused both sides to accept the mutual condemnations of 1054 as final. On the first anniversary of that lifting of the anathemas, Patriarch Athenagoras wrote to Paul VI, this is a time for Christian courage. Let us love one another in order to confess our former, former common faith. The following year, in his address to the Bishops' Conference in Rome, October 26, 1967, Athenagoras declared that the time of reunion may well be the future, but the time of love is the present. 1969 saw the beginning of a paramount and hitherto uninterrupted tradition, namely the exchange of formal annual delegations at the respective patron feasts in Rome on June the 29th, Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, and in Istanbul on November 30th, Feast of St. Andrew. Pope Francis visited the Ecumenical Patriarchate last year on the Feast of St. Andrew. All of these initiatives culminated in the creation, 10 years later, during the visit by John Paul II to the Fanar on November 30th, on one of these such occasions of the patron feast at the Patriarchate, the creation of the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the two churches, of which Father Paul is a member. So the dialogue of truth succeeded the dialogue of love on May 29, 1980, arguably the first time since 1439 that Eastern and Western theologians engaged at the highest level in formal theological debate. Of course, Father Paul will talk about this, no one said it would be easy. Well, actually, Remember the microphones left open during the meeting in 1964? Pope Paul was overheard saying, I hope that it will be easier than we think. Athenagoras knew better. He said, we will do all that we can 
but there are two or three points of doctrine on which your church has evolved. Paul added somberly, but resolutely, nonetheless, there's no question of prestige or primacy other than that established by Christ. No human ambition should prevail except the glory of service. And indeed, despite setbacks and tensions, relations between the two churches have improved so dramatically that contacts between regional and global leaders, as well as local parishes and individual faithful, are today almost taken for granted. The spontaneous decision by Patriarch Bartholomew to attend the inaugural Mass of Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square on March 19, 2013, again sent commentators scurrying to the history books. The media promoted the event as unprecedented since the schism of the 11th century. In fact, it was the first and only time in history that one leader was attending the installation of the other. It was uh, on that same day that the Patriarch invited the Pope to commemorate the meeting of 1964 in Jerusalem between their predecessors, Athenagoras and Paul, with another pilgrimage in 2014. I was privileged to witness that meeting in Jerusalem. And as I watched those two leaders approaching the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I visualized two frail mortals bowing down to the one who alone could provide unity and immortality. In our age, the use and abuse of religion for political and other secular purposes, the difficulties facing Christians all over the world, particularly in the Holy Land, the whole of the Middle East, the injustices inflicted on the weak members of contemporary societies, the alarming refugee exodus, and the ecological crisis that threatens the balance and very survival of God's creation, all of these call for a common and collaborative solution to the problems that still divide us. That's my hope for the future. Thank you. Dear friends, it is a very great pleasure to be taking part in this event to celebrate the remarkable progress in relations between Catholics and Orthodox, indeed from mutual excommunications to growing communion in the last 50 years or so. And I thank Dr. Fagioli very much for kindly inviting me and Dr. Gavriljuk for his very kind introduction. And I am particularly delighted to be sharing the presentation with Archdeacon Dr. John Chrysavgis, a distinguished representative, as you know, of the Patriarchate of Constantinople and a close collaborator of ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew himself. And thank you, John, for this wonderful story that you have told us of progress in the last 50 years for contextualizing it against the history of the 11th century and for these beautiful pictures that have captivated us and for leaving this beautiful picture on the screen as I speak. I hope, friends, that you have the handout uh, with significant dates and events and quotations that was distributed before. Does everybody have that handout? Please don't worry as you look at it and you think, good heavens, are we going to go through all this line by line? No, we're not. So I'm just going to take uh, one or two extracts from that, but I hope that you might find that just uh, a good work of reference, just with some of the, uh, the main points from the ecumenical movement overall of the last hundred years or so. The story of Catholic Orthodox theological dialogue, which is what I'm particularly going to reflect on this evening, is of course woven into this bigger story of, of a wide ecumenical movement. One of the most significant dates there, as you'll see, and we've just been hearing, was the 5th of January 1964, 
When Pope Paul VI met ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, as Archdeacon John has been telling us, that historic encounter really inaugurated the modern push for reconciliation between Catholics and Orthodox, and regular prominent meetings of successive popes and ecumenical patriarchs have been a notable feature of Catholic Orthodox relations ever since. Theological dialogue between the two churches didn't begin for another 15 years or so. There was, first of all, the dialogue of charity. But the national dialogue between Catholics and Orthodox here in the USA began almost immediately afterwards, actually in September of 1965, before even the mutual excommunications were lifted, then in December of 1965. So here in the States, Dialogue began very quickly, very eagerly, and that's a marvelous thing. The lifting of the mutual excommunications was really, as Archdeacon John said, a mutual statement of intent to repair our tragically fractured communion. The formal theological dialogue between our churches restarted after a period of intense difficulty in 2005 with new co-chairmen and many new members. That's when I myself and others were drafted in. And an important agreed statement was uh, settled and finalized in 2007 at, at Ravenna in northern Italy, opening the way for the latest phase of discussion of the most difficult topic of all between Catholics and Orthodox, namely universal primacy or the papacy. Dialogue on that topic in the intervening years since... Uh, 2007, has been rather labored. However, the election of Pope Francis just two and a half years ago has had a galvanizing effect, not only on the Catholic Church and on the world at large, but also on Catholic Orthodox dialogue. When Pope Francis appeared on the balcony of St. Peter's immediately after his election, he instantly sent some new signals about his ministry and his office, he referred to himself not as the new supreme pontiff, but as the new bishop of Rome. And he used St. Ignatius of Antioch's phrase from the earliest patristic times, around about 100 AD, when he referred to Rome as the church which presides in charity, implicitly understanding the church as a communion, not as a pyramid. Six days later, as we were hearing for the first time ever, a patriarch of Constantinople attended the inauguration of a new bishop of Rome. And it said that ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew did that because the first impressions created by Pope Francis were so positive. Building on those auspicious beginnings, the two leaders met again twice last year, 2014, in Jerusalem in May and in Constantinople in November. And the warmth of both of those meetings was palpable. The International Dialogue held another plenary meeting in September of last year in Amman in Jordan when we got close to an agreement on synodality and primacy. I'll explain that pairing of terms in just a moment. But we didn't quite achieve the full consensus that's needed. And so this summer we had further smaller meetings in Rome to revise the draft from Amman. And I'm very happy to report that we now do have a text that we think both sides might be able to agree on. Another plenary will need to be held in order to consider that revised draft, and we hope that that might be able to happen next year. So, synodality and primacy. Broadly speaking, synodality means journeying together. Pope Francis has been speaking of this a lot. Journeying together with all members of the church supporting one another and taking counsel together on our way to the kingdom of God. More technically, it refers to the collaboration and decision-making by the bishops who lead the church, especially in synods or councils, so the words conciliarity and collegiality are sometimes used as well. Primacy focuses on specific leading figures, the bishop locally, the metropolitan or patriarch regionally, and the pope universally. Sometimes it's thought that those are two different kinds of leadership and government, two different systems, synodality and primacy. 
But a key principle of our dialogue is that they actually go together. Synodality needs primacy in order to function. There needs to be leadership and coordination. And on the other hand, primacy needs synodality in order to benefit from the wisdom of others and to avoid being repressive. If Orthodox tend to specialize in synodality, it could well be said that Catholics specialize in primacy. And how? <laughs> but neither of those specializations is healthy on its own. We need to learn from one another. And that surely how eventually, please God, we will reestablish communion between us. Pope Francis has said quite plainly that the Catholic Church needs to learn from the Orthodox Church about synodality. The Catholic Church does in fact have a synod of bishops. It was established in 1965 at the end of the Second Vatican Council and it meets about every three years or so for three or four weeks at a time. A major meeting, as you probably know, on the theme of the family took place just recently in Rome. And during it, Pope Francis gave a very significant address, emphasizing the importance of synodality. He explained his vision, in fact, of what he called a fully synodal church, served by all of the church's ministers and ultimately by himself as universal primate, the servant of the servants of God. Now, in September, of course, Pope Francis himself came here to the USA and made a huge impact, not just on Catholics, but on the whole country, by his presence, his gentle manner, and his strong gospel message. He showed the benefit of having a clear focal point for leadership and teaching in the church. And that's the benefit of primacy and the importance of primacy. So the interaction and uh, mutual fitting together of primacy and synodality for the health and well-being of the church is an enormously topical issue, not only within the Catholic Orthodox dialogue, but within the Catholic Church itself. Very briefly, how in recent times during the, uh, the ecumenical movement that you have on your chart, did we get to where we are now? If you look on the, the top sheet has dates and quotations. If you look at the second sheet, you'll see a diagram. And the diagram looks rather like a tuning fork with a timeline coming down the middle. On the left-hand side is the Catholic Church. On the right-hand side is the other churches. It's grouped like that because the ecumenical movement began on the right-hand side of that diagram. And the Catholic Church held itself rather aloof until the Second Vatican Council with its uh, dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, and its decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio. The famous verse that we all think of from the scriptures when we think of ecumenism is John 17, 21, Jesus' prayer at the Last Supper. Father, may they be one so the world may believe. There's an important link between church unity and missionary outreach. And in fact, on the right-hand side of that diagram, one of the landmark events in the modern ecumenical movement is the Edinburgh Missionary Conference from 1910. If you look at the top of the chart of dates, you'll see that that was followed in 1920 by two very important initiatives. One from the Anglican Communion, the Seventh Lambeth Conference, but the second from the Ecumenical Patriarchate itself with a very important encyclical letter of 1920. So the Orthodox Church was part of that ecumenical movement right from the very start in the early 20th century. The Catholic Church joined, as I said, rather belatedly it, during the Second Vatican Council. And then we had the meeting of uh, Patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI. All of that was happening just as the council itself was deciding that dialogue was the way forward for the Catholic Church. And we must get involved in this ecumenical movement as a work of the Holy Spirit, as a sign of the times. And the dialogue of charity began. If we jump 15 years, as Archdeacon John was telling us, when Pope John Paul went to uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, but we call it Constantinople, uh, in 1979, he and Ecumenical Patriarch Demetrios announced the start of the theological dialogue and said, and hoped that in fact the start of the third millennium would see both churches fully reconciled with one another because he said the world is waiting for this sign of unity if it's going to be evangelized. 
Well, unfortunately, we missed that target date of 2000, but it is vital that we realize that the world is waiting for this sign of reconciliation between Catholics and Orthodox. Pope Francis and Patriarch uh, Bartholomew again stressed that many times last year. So the formal theological dialogue began uh, or was announced in 1979 and began in 1980. It hit severe difficulties, however, after really strong progress through the 1980s. In 1990, with the fall of communism, you might wonder, well, why? What on earth caused the difficulty? A new freedom of religion allowed many members of Catholic Eastern churches, some of which had been brutally repressed under the Soviet Empire, to reassert their Catholic identity once the Berlin Wall fell. And this raised again the thorny issue of what's often called uniatism, namely the fact that there are Eastern Christians who at various times in history have restored their communion with the Pope, and indeed some Eastern Christians whose communion with the Pope was never actually broken. Orthodox delegates insisted that this topic of uniatism, which had always been controversial, be moved then to the very top of the agenda. And a statement on uniatism was agreed in 1993 in Balamand. You can see it on your chart there, but it really didn't clear the air. A rather acrimonious meeting was then held in Baltimore in 2000. And then many people thought that sadly the dialogue had run into the sand. Happily, as I mentioned before, it resumed in 2005. The newly reconstituted International Dialogue held a plenary meeting in Belgrade in 2006, prior to the Ravenna meeting of 2007. And it's worth noting that we were welcomed to Serbia, not only by Patriarch Pavle and the Serbian Orthodox Church, but also by the civil authorities. Both the Prime Minister and the President of Serbia hosted dinners for us. Why, you might ask? Well, the fact is that the world warms to the witness of dialogue. Even before the full communion that we hope for, our very dialogue is a sign of God's grace at work in the world, a sign of peace in a world plagued by conflict. Cardinal Casper, who was, until a few years ago, the head of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, once said that the 20th century, horribly marked by war and innocent suffering, in that century, ecumenism was a light shining in the darkness and a powerful peace movement. When the dialogue began in 1980, the formal theological dialogue, it was decided very wisely that the dialogue should begin with the elements which unite the Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. As you can see on the chart there of dates, there was an agreed statement in 1982 on Eucharist, Church, and Trinity. In 1987, on faith, sacraments, and ecclesial unity. And in 1988, on ordination, apostolic succession, and sanctification. All of those documents in quick succession, a blessed reminder of how much we share. It's important to see the pattern and the purpose behind that sequence of topics. Catholics and Orthodox want to celebrate the Eucharist together again. That will be the sign and the seal of our full communion. Building towards that blessed goal, first of all, we have to agree on what the Eucharist is. That was the first agreed statement. And that first agreed statement really established the foundation and the framework for everything that's followed. The church is a communion, koinonia as we often say, by participation in the life of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the source of all communion, the blessed Trinity. And in the Eucharist we receive communion, as we say so significantly. We receive the very life of the church. So, as that document said, there's a profound correspondence between the Eucharist, the Church, and the Trinity. And we needed to agree on what the Eucharist is, and we did. What a massive and wonderful foundation for our dialogue. And then, of course, we need to agree on the various preconditions for the Eucharist. Faith and baptism, first of all. Well, that was the second statement. 
Then ordination in apostolic succession through the ages, vertically, as it were, going through history. Well, that was the third statement. And finally, we need to agree on the bonds of communion which should unite the church horizontally, as it were, here and now across the face of the earth. And that means each local bishop with his own community and then local churches with one another, both regionally and universally via their bishops. And this is where the whole business of synodality and primacy fits in. It's the last piece of the jigsaw, if you like. The whole project has been and still is aimed, please God, at restoring Eucharistic communion. The Ravenna document adopted the idea of the church's life as having three levels, local, regional, and universal. And we agreed, Catholics and Orthodox, on two key principles. First of all, that there has been and ought to be some kind of primacy, leadership, or headship at all three levels, the bishop locally, the metropolitan or patriarch regionally, and a universal primacy too. And secondly, we agreed that primacy and conciliarity or synodality are mutually interdependent. Those two affirmations are crucial achievements of the Ravenna document, preparing us to tackle the most difficult issue of all between Catholics and Orthodox, namely universal primacy. There's no doubt, of course, that there's only one candidate for the office of universal primate, namely the Bishop of Rome. The text acknowledges that Rome has always been first in the listing or taxes of the major sees from ancient times, and it quotes those famous words of Ignatius of Antioch. The local church of Rome presides in charity. It remains, says the Ravenna document in conclusion, for the role of the Bishop of Rome in the communion of all the churches to be studied in greater depth. And so that's where we are. And I wrote this little book, A Service of Love, just recently that Dr. Gavriluk mentioned just before, with some suggestions as to what that role of the Bishop of Rome might be in a reunited church. The first millennium before 1054 has to be our guide, and that's agreed between Catholics and Orthodox. That's the era we look to for guidance. And naturally, as a Catholic, I want to take account of what the Second Vatican Council said about the role of the Bishop of Rome. And so, in this little book, I suggest three possible ways in which the Bishop of Rome might indeed serve the universal communion re-established East and West between Christians. Namely, moderating disputes, presiding at ecumenical councils, and serving Eucharistic communion. And just to finish, I'd like to give just a little outline of each of those three possible services just to indicate from where we are now, what are the possible ways in which we might think of the next few paces? And so, first of all, moderating disputes. Vatican II said, for many centuries, the churches of East and West went their own ways, though a brotherly communion of faith and sacramental life bound them together. And that's true. There was uh, a sort of uh, complementarity, East and West, during the first millennium. Not always a very close contact, but a sort of tolerance of one another and appreciation at various times. Rifts, but then repairs. But a, a brotherly communion of faith and sacramental life bound East and West together. If disagreements, this is the council again, in faith and discipline arose between them, uh, between East and West, the Roman See acted by common consent as moderator. Well, the church needs a final court of arbitration to restore peace and Eucharistic fellowship when those have been broken. And there's plenty of evidence that Rome was indeed recognized in the first millennium as the place that you could ultimately turn to if regional uh, methods of, of dispute resolution had failed. In the chaotic aftermath of the Council of Nicaea, for instance, which refuted Arianism, much of the East remained Arian, and Orthodox bishops like St. Athanasius were deposed from their sees and suffered greatly. In the context of that crisis, in 343, a major council was in fact held at Sardica, 
which crafted rules for cases where a bishop had a grievance that couldn't be resolved locally. He could appeal to the Bishop of Rome, who wouldn't judge the matter himself, but could decide if there needed to be a retrial and could send delegates to sit with the local bishops and reach a judgment with them. Those rather nuanced rules were accepted not only in the West, but also later on in the East too, and they might be very helpful in ecumenical discussion today. So moderating disputes. The second possible service, presiding at ecumenical councils. Lumen Gentium teaches that there never is an ecumenical council which is not confirmed or at least recognized as such by Peter's successor, and that it's the prerogative of the Roman pontiff to convoke such councils, to preside over them, and to confirm them. Well, the convoking of an ecumenical council by a pope is something that didn't actually happen until the 12th century, significantly after that split between West and East. Prior to that time, councils were normally convoked by the emperor, often, however, with the encouragement of the pope because of particular pressing needs. Though popes never personally attended ecumenical councils in the first millennium, they normally sent delegates and their involvement in some capacity was always regarded as a necessary condition for a council to be classed as ecumenical. The bond between popes and councils is actually very clear in the first millennium. After the reading of Pope Leo's tome on Christology at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, for instance, the bishops cried out, Peter has spoken through Leo. The second council of Nicaea held in 787, which was the last of the seven councils that both Catholics and Orthodox recognize as ecumenical actually gave a list of criteria for a properly ecumenical council, among which it clearly stated that the Pope of the Romans has to be a cooperator or a fellow worker with the council, at least by letter or representatives. And I think that there would be broad ecumenical agreement today that the Bishop of Rome, in consultation with his brother bishops, of course, should convoke and preside at ecumenical councils. And so finally, the third possible service, serving Eucharistic communion. Those previous two services that I mentioned, moderating disputes and presiding at ecumenical councils, are both vital, but they're occasional and exercised only as needed. And so the question arises, is there an abiding ministry exercised by a universal primate such that that office might indeed be understood as willed and established by the Lord himself as a constitutive part of his church? Well, recalling the early church, Vatican II referred to the very ancient discipline whereby the bishops installed throughout the whole world lived in communion with one another and with the Roman pontiff in a bond of unity, charity, and peace. That communion was celebrated and strengthened in every Eucharist, where the bishop of Rome and the other heads of their own churches were named and prayed for, and visitors from other local churches were welcomed at a local uh, celebration. In essence, I would suggest that the universal primate symbolizes and serves the Eucharistic communion of the church as a whole, the universal fellowship enjoyed by Christians, thanks to the one Eucharist that's celebrated in countless places across the world. In particular, he symbolizes and serves the collegial unity of the bishops themselves, he and they being the successors of the apostles who sat with the Lord at the Last Supper. The understanding of the church as a communion of local churches was characteristic of the first millennium before the West became highly juridical and the pyramid emerged. As it did, major Eastern figures complained that instead of being an elder sister, as they were quite willing to recognize, Rome was now claiming to be mother of all the churches, source and origin of them all, with a universal jurisdiction and so that breach between East and West was hardened. The communion model of the church has made a big comeback in recent times, and the pyramid is much less evident 
And the idea of Rome as mother of all the churches has vanished. Vatican II very significantly said that in any future reconciliation between Catholics and Orthodox, the right of Eastern churches to govern themselves had to be recognized while remembering the necessary unity of the whole church. That little phrase was added because something, some ministry, has to express and serve that necessary unity of the whole church. And that, I suggest, is precisely where a universal primacy fits in. It's not about governance. It's not about jurisdiction. It's about securing communion. Ultimately, then, it's surely the Eucharist which must, which must guide us towards a solution on universal primacy. What's essential is that the unity that the whole church has, east and west, through the celebration of one and the same Eucharist, in all of our different particular churches must be made visible. Charity, agape, was actually a patristic term for the Eucharist. And that led Cardinal Ratzinger to suggest that presiding in charity, to recall that famous term of St. Ignatius, meant quite simply caring for the church's Eucharistic unity. And when Cardinal Ratzinger himself became Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, he explained that idea more fully, and I'd like just to close with his rather moving words. Quote, the Petrine ministry is a primacy of love in the Eucharistic sense. That is to say, solicitude for the universal communion of the church in Christ. And the Eucharist is the shape and the measure of that communion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Father John and Father Paul, for these heartfelt, uh, profound and mind-stirring reflections that are based on decades uh, of uh, reflection and prayer and participation in the ecumenical dialogue. If we could also ask uh, Father John now to join us uh, on the stage for the following uh, question uh, and answer uh, period. And uh, as you ask your questions, uh, we would ask you uh, to come uh, to the two microphones that you see uh, or, uh, on, in both uh, aisles. So uh, uh, just raise your hand and then subsequently uh, come, come to the microphones. Um, in the theological debate, um, has the topic of marriage um, and the acceptance of divorce in the Orthodox Church come up at all? And can you comment on that, um, both sides, I guess? Uh, in the dialogue itself, I guess that's for Father Paul to really answer. Yeah, in the, in the dialogue itself, uh, the question has not come up. Um, it's, it's not on the agenda of the international dialogue. What I would say with regard to the, uh, the national dialogue, though, is that, that the in international dialogue and the national dialogue are similar in some ways but different in others. And the, the, one of the things that the national dialogue between Catholics and Orthodox has, has done over the years is to reflect on a lot of pastoral issues, that, some of which pertain particularly to, for instance, North America. And so it has produced various guidelines for mixed marriages between Catholics and Orthodox and a number of issues relating to, to that. So um, nothing precisely on the, the issue that you mentioned, which of course has been receiving quite a bit of publicity in recent times. Um, but so far, nothing specifically on that, no. Yeah, I might just add, if this is loud, I might just add that um, the issue of marriage and divorce um, is it's there on the surface for both churches to discuss. And um, I, I think that the um, Roman Catholic Church with the, the recent synod has begun to take on this issue, but it's proving fairly controversial. Uh, the Orthodox Church is supposed to take on this issue, uh, 
um, in uh, the great council that they're planning for next year, but I doubt very much whether it will take it up in any meaningful way. Uh, that's very sad for me because I think these are the issues that someone's trying to correct me. <laughs> Is it? Can you hear? Okay. Um, I, that's very sad for me because that's what both churches need to be looking at. Uh, it's these pastoral issues that are affecting the lives of its people, um, affecting families, affecting clergy families in my own tradition. So I think it's very sad in a sense that it's taking so long and it's causing so much um, uh, you know, of a problem in both of our churches. I would like to see them you know, bite the bullet a little bit more honestly and uh, compassionately. Just a, as a quick follow-up uh, comment, uh, would, would you think, uh, where, where is, for example, at this point, the practice of intermarriages, both in North America and the, particularly between Catholics and Orthodox in North America and perhaps in the Middle East? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, as Father Paul mentioned, the, the dialogue here in the United States um, on the one hand has followed sort of the, the lead of the, the um, uh, international dialogue on some issues. In other, in other ways, it, it started well before that international dialogue and has dealt with many more uh, substantial issues in, in some ways. Um, it's the longest standing continuing dialogue um, in the world between the two churches. So they've dealt with these issues and uh, certainly in the Middle East where they face these um, issues in an, an existential way almost where the Catholics and the Orthodox are living side by side as tiny nervous minorities in you know, overwhelmingly Muslim countries, they tend to see things a little bit differently. Um, they tend to prioritize a little differently. And I think that's very encouraging too. But for the most part, at least in the Orthodox Church, you have to remember that many of the 14 independent or autocephalous Orthodox churches are very national churches, uh, ethnic even churches. So when you have a church of Russia, church of Georgia, church of Bulgaria, church of Serbia or Romania or Greece or Cyprus, their understanding of, uh, you know, mixed marriages, for want of a better word. I've never understood exactly what that means. It's not like a human being and uh, whatever. But in terms of marriages between Orthodox and Roman Catholics, um, I think you'll find a far more narrow, even conservative, sometimes even closed view in some of these churches. Uh, and that's very sad. But where, whereas in Australia, in uh, America, in the United Kingdom, in Western Europe, uh, they are a lot more open on these issues. Father Paul, would you like to add anything to this particular point? Any other questions? Could both of you comment briefly on, like, internally within each of our own churches, what kind of would be some of the major roadblocks moving forward in ecumenical dialogue? Because we've talked a lot about like, the churches talking together, but I also understand that there are conflicts within our own churches that might make moving forward difficult. Uh, do you mean with regard to Catholic Orthodox dialogue yes, or yes, across with, the with, board? Oh, specifically with regard to Catholic Orthodox dialogue. So are there things in the, like, within the Catholic Church that would make that, moving that dialogue forward more difficult or within our Orthodox Church moving that dialogue? I think that... Um, that uh, well, thank you very much for the, the question. First of all, because this is this is very important. Because you know, you we have a, a formal dialogue between us. We have the official meetings, but there, there, these initiatives cannot possibly finally be uh, you know fulfilled in in the reconciliation of the churches unless there's an absolute groundswell amongst the faithful on both sides, and that's a movement of the Holy Spirit. That's a movement of prayer and desire. Now, from the Catholic side, I think I would say that there is a great eagerness for that amongst the faithful. Um, that there has, I think we must pay tribute uh, to the Second Vatican Council for this. Uh, the Orthodoxy has not had a similar moment when, you know, the, the, the whole kind of 
spectrum of the church life and, and practice in, ha, has been assessed for the modern age like Vatican II was for us. And so the Catholic Church officially joined the ecumenical movement with great enthusiasm at the Second Vatican Council. And now there would be few Catholics, really, who would, would have reservations about that, especially with regard to the Orthodox. If you think of the ways in which, you know, quite commonly now in a Catholic home, you might find an icon on the wall. You know, they might not call it an icon, they might just call it a holy picture, but it's an icon because we just feel that spiritual closeness, you know? There's a, there's a great sort of uh, a, a meeting of hearts, I think, and, and that Catholics feel very much. And so I think on the Catholic side, there's an eagerness for that. And I, and I wouldn't really see any particular obstacles at all on the Catholic side to, to reconciliation with the Orthodox. Um, so that's answering from the Catholic side, but uh, I'd, I'd like to hand over to Archdeacon John. <laughs> okay, so this is the bad news. Um, I, I, Father, I was really touched uh, the way you were speaking about you know, the developments of um, um, communication and dialogue between various churches and especially our churches uh, in your presentation. There was an enthusiasm in your voice, as there was in your answer now, which I am very moved by. Um, and to hear you say, for instance, that on the Roman Catholic side, on the, that sort of ground level, there is, you know, for the most part, this... Um, great desire for moving ahead um, it is very touching, and I think that is so important if anything's going to happen. Um, I might, however, say that I don't know if I see exactly the same enthusiasm on the orthodox side. I think it should be there, but I don't think it's there, at least not in the way I heard it come across in your voice and in your response now. I think that certainly, you know, on the theological level, people who understand theology, I think, get this um, and uh, realize how important it is. Uh, I don't know how much of formation or education there's been, possibly because what you, what you said, this groundswelling of the Vatican II, um, that in orthodox circles, you'll find a lot more resistance. You'll find a um, uh, you know, a lot more um, hesitation. Um, you won't find, I think, any Orthodox coming even close to, say, the title of your book. The year 2000 was a, an, an, a goal that we, you know, had for unity, even if you're putting a question mark on it. Um, and I think it's almost sad that we don't. It's so important for us to... Um, to have this goal in mind, because we, we talk about it, and yet in our hearts, I don't know how much. I remember um, hearing Patriarch Bartholomew um, uh, not too long ago, probably about a year ago, when he was addressing a group of um, pilgrims to Istanbul, um, to Constantinople, to the Patriarchate there, and uh, someone actually asked him in the church, um, when do you think? Um, there can be unity between our churches. And I waited to hear, because I thought, how is he going to answer this? What's he going to do? And the patriarch said, well, I want unity, the way Francis, I think, would say, I want unity. And he said, but I cannot see it happening in my lifetime. And I thought that there was just a kind of um, a reflection, not just realism, but a reflection of probably where much of the Orthodox Church really stands. And that even if he feels like moving faster, he's got to look back and pull the rest of the church as well. Uh, it was Athenagoras that said, um, if only we can lock away all the theologians on an island just for a week, we can pull off unity. And then we can invite them back again. So, you know, there, there is that sense of um, caution, I think, uh, if I was to answer and say, what's the one thing that stands in the way? I would probably say it's arrogance. I think it's arrogance on our part as Orthodox that we feel we have this arrogance of truth that we can only give and not take. I think there's an, an arrogance, a secular kind of an arrogance of strength 
in the Roman Catholic Church where they're so big it's difficult to be humble. I think there's an arrogance in the uh, national churches among the Orthodox themselves that feel that they have something that they cannot possibly ever give up um, to any other Orthodox church, let alone the Roman Catholic Church. I, I think that there's a sense of arrogance that, you know, it, the whole notion of primacy for me can work if we can remember that mandate of Christ that the first should be last, the last should be first. And that somehow fits with conciliarity and primacy, but we forget that. Uh, once you wear black, there's no going back. That's terrible. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that becomes more of a problem in terms of arrogance the higher up on that hierarchy that you tend to go. And that's a sad reality that I see. Um. Father John has uh, uh, virtually answered the question I was going to ask, but I was going to propose perhaps, uh, which had to do with what I would call psychological resistance to uh, uh, ecumenical reunion. Uh, I was going to propose that uh, rather than arrogance, uh, that it's a measure of insecurity. Uh, a friend of mine who has been very close to the dialogue over the years uh, has described uh, the orthodox uh, anxiety about being swallowed by the whale. Um, and, but is perhaps a, just a different flip side to what you were describing. So I would like to turn my question then, since I think you, thank you for your response in advance. Um, uh, so Father Paul, um, if we want to talk about the primacy, the elephant in the room is Vatican I. Uh, how are we going to finesse that? I offer some thoughts about precisely that question. <laughs> In this little book uh, called A Service of Love, available at all good bookshops. <laughs> and um, there's, a, there's actually, I, I, there's a new edition of it with a postscript uh, uh, bringing things uh, up to date because of uh, the arrival of Pope Francis, because I finished this book just as Pope Benedict uh, resigned. And so I have written a postscript, and the, the, the new edition of this is going to come out literally within a couple of, uh, within a matter of weeks. And um, because for Catholics, we were talking about this actually just earlier on today. Um, for Catholics, you know, there, uh, some people tend to think that, you know, well, Vatican II, of course, opened the doors, ecumenism and all the rest. Vatican I, uh, mm, well, let's just kind of try and walk around it, you know, tiptoe around it. Well, you can't do that as a Catholic because it's an ecumenical council. And so we have to take Vatican I and absolutely, um, you know, face it and, and uh, see what it says and learn from it. And the fact is that Vatican I has received a rather um, uh, distorted uh, press, shall we say. A lot of people think they know what Vatican I said when they've never actually read the documents and seen the sort of nuances that there are in the documents. And, um, and so quite a lot of work has been going on in recent times to actually revisit those documents and try and put them in the context of the times and just try and <clears throat> see the ways in which, you know, Vatican II said some things very much conditioned by the time that was in, the dangers that were facing the church at that time. And, um, and to see how Vatican I, of course, was incomplete because Vatican I was, had a, a program for its work and was actually just adjourned in 1870 um, after having only been in session for a year. Um, be <laughs> well, whatever the reasons, it was the, 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 the fact is that it, it, it was cut short and everybody knew at some stage the whole project would have to be resumed. I think it was probably providential that we waited 100 years then for all the massive renewal that took place in the early 20th century, the patristic renewal, liturgical renewal, um, biblical renewal, and uh, you know, matters of primacy and, um, and the relationship between the pope and the bishops had been treated at Vatican I in a very juridical language. It was almost as if that was the only language available. And it, it, it's actually a straitjacket. <laughs> 
So Vatican I is trying to say, and is saying, very important things, but within the constraints of a particular kind of vocabulary. And so the, the language at Vatican I, when talking about pope and bishops, is all about jurisdiction. Whereas Vatican II has a much uh, more biblical, liturgical, and patristic kind of uh, vocabulary at its, at its fingertips, and is able to go back and, and reinforce what Vatican I said, but saying it in a much more understandable, comprehensible, nuanced sort of way. And for instance, uh, particularly I was thinking there of what it says about primacy with regard to what it says about infallibility, which of course is another big uh, question people get concerned about. We need to remember, of course, that Vatican I specifically anchored the infallibility of the Pope as, as a manifestation in privileged circumstances of the infallibility of the church. So when you think of, you know, it, it, the Pope expresses in certain very precisely defined circumstances the faith which the Lord wanted his church to possess. So he's not some personal oracle who can just speak at whim on whatever, you know. In very careful circumstances, we believe that he can, he can voice the faith of the church. And the, the two, the two uh, um, infallible statements of recent times, the definition of the Immaculate Conception in 1854, before Vatican I, <laughs> funnily enough, and the, the definition of Mary's Assumption in 1950, were actually both preceded by a very wide canvassing of the faith of the, the, the faithful. The Pope asked the bishops to, to, to monitor the faith of their, their people and to feed back the results. Is this the faith of the church? And only then did he proclaim it. So, you know, there's, a, there's actually a lot more going on than people tend to think. So, um, so Vatican I, we must squarely uh, reckon with. And, in fact, you know, there, there's, there's no need to be afraid in doing so. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, commentary on Vatican I, uh, which, of course, uh, you mentioned you called it ecumenical. Uh, and, of course, since, since the council itself was neither attended by the Orthodox nor received by the Orthodox, it's not our favorite local council. Uh, it's perhaps <laughs> possibly a general council and certainly only very provisionally ecumenical council, which, which actually moves me precisely to the question of the elephant in the room that's being considered here all the time. You mentioned uh, earlier in your uh, presentation, a uh, very compelling presentation, that the great schism of 1054 was not great at all because the set of issues that, in fact, were separating churches uh, were at least on some of them were seemingly trivial. Now, the beers were a serious matter, but the rest <laughs> were really, uh, really trivial. Uh, but, of course, later on, uh, the, the separation of the churches was no longer a trivial matter, and that is what made the schism, if you will, serious. It's a bit like a, a divorce over a trivial matter, but then people grow estranged, mm -hmm. and then it becomes a serious issue. So the question of primacy is still an impediment for us in many ways. And I wonder if you could comment on the reception, perhaps, by different Orthodox churches of the most recent discussion of privacy. In other words, is there perhaps a difference in the way in which uh, different uh, Orthodox communions uh, at this point receive the conversation about the privacy mm. of the Pope? Um, I, I, Father Paul mentioned earlier uh, over lunch today that um, the Roman Catholic Church has actually been discussing these issues for a long time. Uh, the Orthodox Church has been discussing them actually very only very recently. So it's not been long in the theological you know, uh, discussions, deliberations among the Orthodox themselves. It's a fairly new phenomenon and I think they're still, they will be grappling with it for quite some time. Um, and they need to almost be ready to understand it differently to what they've understood it so far, because up until now we saw primacy as uh, what that side did. And therefore, first of all, it has to be wrong because it's that side. And secondly, we have to be totally different to that. We can't possibly have any sense of primacy. And um, I think that the, the Orthodox churches now have to begin to understand that uh, that may not be the way forward, that that might be almost a, an old school kind of theology as opposed to a forward-looking kind of a theology, that there may be a different understanding of primacy uh, 
that the early church, the first millennium that, again, as Father Paul mentioned, uh, might have to offer us. Um, otherwise, uh, as, as I you know, say often, if we don't understand that there's one primate, even on a universal level, whether it would be the, the Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, which I think most Orthodox would theologically, theoretically uh, accept. Um, and in the case of the more conservative churches that aren't really in favor of union with Rome, they're happy to accept it because since we'll never be united with Rome, the Pope will never be number one anyway. So there, you know, but on a theological level or historical level, people are pretty okay with accepting that if there was unity, that the Pope of Rome would in fact be the first among equals. Um, but most Orthodox have a problem with issues of authority. Maybe it is the insecurity you mentioned. I don't know, but when I attend uh, meetings of uh, the autocephalous Orthodox churches, and there are 14 of them, um, I don't see the issue of a pope as being the problem. I see the issue of 14 popes as being the real problem around the room. So I, I think these are issues that we're just beginning to grapple with, and it will take some time, and it will take some almost give and take. The, the Orthodox are going to have to recognize that it may not be just the way we've seen it over the last 2,000 years, uh, because we've developed too. We think the Roman pap uh, the papacy has developed into a certain concept of primacy, but so too have we developed or, you know, some different form of what was going on in the first millennium has developed in our churches. Father Paul, you have the last word, if you would like. <laughs> That's what the well, Pope does. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I think I would just want to... Um, to, to reiterate that point that, uh, that Father John just made, that, that there has been a lot of fresh thinking going on in, in the Catholic Church about primacy in recent times, and, and precisely to link primacy to Eucharist um, as, uh, along the lines that I, was, that I was mentioning. Because we tend to think still, I suppose, you know, it, it, we think instinctively the Pope, we think of the pyramid, probably comes immediately to our minds. There's the Pope at the top. The, the, when Pope Francis appeared on the balcony and said, that he was the new bishop of Rome, the church which presides in charity. He was going back to the beginning of the first millennium. The pyramid comes from the beginning of the second millennium. He was going back to what St. Ignatius of Antioch said around the year 100 AD. And so, you know, there is a primacy that he was acknowledging. And it's not a primacy that's at the top of the pyramid. The, a primacy doesn't have to mean at the top of the pyramid. It can mean at the center of a network of love and charity that's sustained by the Eucharist. And that's the sort of picture that, that actually has been developing within the Catholic Church in, in the last 20, 30 years. And, um, if you, and that's certainly the, 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 the kind of approach that's now being tried by the Catholic Orthodox Dialogue. So, you know, we, 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 we must be receptive to fresh ways of looking at things. And I think, um, you know, it's important to realize that in the decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, one of the very important sections it has is about spiritual ecumenism. And spiritual ecumenism just means the attitude of mind and heart with which we approach the whole ecumenical venture. And uh, it means that, you know, as well as having all these ideas and the theological dialogue and all the rest, in our hearts we must have a love for one another. We must be ready to say sorry for the offense we've given in the past. We must be genuinely receptive to the wisdom and the goodness that others have, ready to learn and not always think that we've got the answers. And if Father John was saying before that, you know, perhaps the Orthodox tend at times to be rather arrogant, thinking we've got nothing to learn. Well, for a long time, and maybe in some ways even today, the Catholic Church was the same. And so, you know, the Catholic Church, when we joined the ecumenical movement at Vatican II, there was a great, one of the phrases that was used in the decree on ecumenism was to end, we agreed to enter into dialogue with others on an equal footing, an equal footing. The Catholic Church for a long time before in the first half of the 20th century had always believed it was the others who left us, it's for them to come back. 
It was you come in -ism rather than ecumenism. <laughs> and so, you know, there was a change of heart there by the, the Catholic Church at Vatican II. And only with that attitude of humility, which Pope Francis, you know, just absolutely exemplifies, and goodness and the Christian basics of charity and mercy and love and all of that, that's the only basis upon which we can build unity. And please God, we will get there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to give the last word to my colleague. Just uh, a couple of words uh, before inviting you to the reception, to the Agape. Uh, the first thing is um, to inform you about the spring events of the Institute. On April the 8th and the 9th, we will have our first uh, conference. The title is the common good isn't common, and it will be on April the 8th and the 9th. One of the speakers will be Bishop McElroy of San Diego. And then we will have on May the 4th the annual lecture of the Institute with, with Erin Lothes uh, on environmental theology. Uh, she's an expert in the theology of the environment for the U.S. bishops. Uh, Please visit our website uh, of the ICC, uh, USD ICC, to uh, stay informed. Uh, but so before going to the, to the reception, please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers for this wonderful event. Thank you again. Thank you.